And with that, I will turn the mic back over to Christian to announce our first speaker. Awesome. Thanks, Josh. Um, yeah, so first up, we're going to have a talk from uh, Teresa. And she, as she mentioned before, she's a PhD student at C4DM at Queen Mary University of London and working in the Augmented Instruments Lab. And uh, her, focus, her, her work focuses on using AI to capture gestures in digital music instruments um, and a lot of topics surrounding that. Um, so I'm really interested to hear what she's going to talk about today. And the title of her talk is Toward Prototyping Neural Networks on Embedded Hardware. So yeah, go ahead and share your screen when you're ready. And the floor is yours, Teresa. OK, hopefully you can see my screen. Yes, side. you're up. OK, great. Thank you. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm Teresa Blinsky. Thank you very much for the introduction and the invite again. Um, yeah, so the title of my talk, Toward Prototyping with Neural Networks in Embedded Hardware Platforms. Mm -hmm. Uh, first, a quick introduction, although I was already introduced. Uh, I'm a second year PhD student uh, at the AI and Music CDT, and I'm supervised by Professor Andrew McPherson from the Imperial College London and Professor Rebecca Fievering from the University of the Arts London. And previously, I did my master's in sound and music computing at the Music Technology Group, Universitat Pompeu Fabra. And I also did my bachelor's in physics at Universidad Autónoma de Madrid at RBTA Aachen, uh, and RBTA Aachen, where I did some uh, acoustics. And well, I obviously wanted to introduce myself, but also today I'm going to be talking about uh, the difficulties and problems uh, of running deep neural networks in embedded systems. Um, some um, partial uh, solutions we came up with, and obviously the difficulties are relative to your programming experience. Um, so I think it's important that I kind of state mine too, uh, so I kind of like tell you what I was when I started my PhD. So. Um, during my undergrad, I did some C++, nothing to, um, I know CMake or nothing hardware related. And then also I did lots of JavaScript for web development and um, lots of MATLAB as well for my bachelor thesis. And then during my master thesis, everything was very like data science workflows with uh, Python, Jupyter Notebooks, uh, deep learning and all of that. So, um, oops, okay. Um, yeah, so when I started my PhD, what I was trying to do was, um, uh, so, you know, I'm in an instrument lab and digital musical instruments, uh, how they capture gesture is through sensors. And what we do is we have these sensor signals uh, and then we kind of map them to some sound parameters. Um, and the idea here was to introduce neural networks into this process and kind of, if I have lots of sensors, can I pass them through a neural network and kind of obtain like, a, a lower dimensional representation uh, of this uh, lots of information, like kind of, kind of sort of more like separated representation or integrated representation and use it to control some um, sound parameters in a digital musical instrument. And yeah, so I had done my master's in deep learning and I was like, great, I'm just gonna like try lots of architectures. I also like studied the acoustics. I'm gonna like leverage these, like introduce some like physical information in these. Uh, it's gonna be great. I'm just gonna try and it works out and I'm gonna fix this problem. Um, yeah, this approach is cool. Uh, it's what I would call prototyping, like just try things out. But in my PhD, I have to do this in an embedded platform. And I will talk uh, later about the platform specifically, which is Bella, by the way. Um, but yeah, um, my idea was like, uh, at some, I just try this out and then I export it in uh, like this C++, C++ and then uh, okay, I can just run it. And and I mean, nothing further from reality, like it is not as easy as that. Um, so yeah, I just came across like this big uh, obstacle, right? I just got very stuck into this, uh, into this. like I, uh, I wanted to start prototyping and I spent like a year trying to get to the stage of prototyping, like trying to find a way of um, actually experiment with neural networks. And I think many of you watching uh, this channel are probably very experienced with C++, but I feel that many people coming from deep learning uh, backgrounds and Python, um, this idea that in, like in embedded systems, you actually have to compile lots of things from source, that things take lots of time and you have very limited CPU resources. Uh, this is like kind of a sort of like a, a new world. Like I find that like uh, there's, this is my personal experience, but I'm sure like lots of people feel like this as well. Like you have this sort of like deep learning Python skills, and then this sort of like physical computing skills uh, with maybe Arduino or Bella. These platforms have APIs that help you like abstract the complexities of interacting with peripherals, or like they kind of like build this 
uh, cyclic systems for you. You kind of ha just have to write code in the render function and it will run in a cyclic system. So you don't, you really need very like basic notions of coding in order, in order to use them. And they kind of like, don't let you see like the part that is like at the hardcore part of like uh, lower software development part of like compiling, uh, linking things, uh, cross compiling if it's very big and so on. So uh, I feel that many people have this sort of like two sets of uh, skills and it's very hard to like combine them. Um, so now I'm going to talk about why embedded systems. So um, if it's so complex to do it, why are we even trying? Um, well, first of all, you can do very cool uh, things like the one at the right. This is an instrument that we haven't still got uh, working fully yet. It's something I we built in a hackathon uh, with, I built in a hackathon with uh, Adan Benito from my lab. And yeah, so in Musical instruments, of course, uh, we need sensors. And these embedded systems, they, they make interfacing with sensors very easier. Uh, it's what we call uh, physical audio computing. Uh, they kind of connect physical reality, gesture and sensors and physical variables to the digital realm. Like you can access those sensor measurements uh, through code. And also, uh, Bella in particular uh, runs a real-time operative system um, that in which the audio thread always has the uh, largest priority, the higher priority. So it has a very low latency, less than one millisecond. And as, as you know, low latency is very important in live performance and in audio. If you have more than 10 milliseconds, it's very hard that you will actually feel like you're playing an instrument as you would feel in an acoustic instrument. So low latency in audio is uh, crucial. And uh, another thing that I think it's very cool about um, these platforms is that, um, well, you can put them inside of an instrument as the video in the right, but also like you can leave them in the instrument. And what I would mean with this is that we use our laptops for uh, maybe making music, but also for like working, for like studying, uh, watching movies, and eventually we update our operative systems and lots of things break. And the idea that in an embedded, you can like purpose an embedded system for like a specific purpose, uh, if that makes sense, and just leave it and it having only one function just makes it more reliable for live performance, which I think is great. And yeah, Belly is based on the Beagle One Black. Uh, so the CPU, it's an ARM Cortex A8, which might not uh, say much to you. It doesn't say much to me. The idea here is that it's a very limited uh, CPU. And um, now we'll see uh, what the limitations, uh, what the difficulties are associated uh, with having such limited resources in an embedded platforms when we're trying to uh, run neural networks in them. So um, yeah, often there's no platform specific instructions to compile libraries. And this might be a skill that if you're very proficient in C++, you're a C++ developer, you might feel very comfortable just building things on your own. But to me, when I first started, I was like, what? Like, uh, where are all of these errors with libraries? I have no idea what's going on. Um, this is was like a very big barrier that I, uh, it was thanks to help of my colleagues that were very experienced with embedded systems that I, I kind of managed to, to like, yeah, with their help understand it. But uh, also it requires a complex ecosystem of devices and programming languages. So uh, you have your Bella, you connect it to your laptop because it doesn't really have a screen. So you access it through SSH, you record your like data set, then you have to kind of move, move data back and forth because um, you have to train the model in your host machines because it, your, so your laptop, because you have small computational power. So it's kind of like lots of moving around of data uh, code. And yeah, you have to use C++, Python, and then uh, lots of terminal stuff. And yeah, the compilation times are very long. So first time I tried to compile libtorch in Bella, I always run into the same error after four hours. So I would like let it run. And after four hours, it would get the same error. It's impossible to debug something if every time you have to wait four hours for the error to pop up, right? So it requires cross compilation. And setting up cross compilation environments on your own, if you've never done it or it's not your area of expertise, is very complex. It's uh, to me, it's like a, something I still don't really understand how you do. But uh, thankfully, I have colleagues who know how to do this. Um, so yeah, also networks need to be very light uh, to run in real time. We're talking about uh, this CPU. I think it, it's more than ten years old. Um, I. I, I can't remember the year, but it's a very old CPU. It doesn't have much uh, computational capacity. So you can only run things that are very, very light. 
Um, and also it's hard to predict if the network will be able to run in real time unless you actually run it. Like you can make an estimate uh, uh, thinking about the counting the number of floating point operations, uh, but it's kind of hard to uh, calculate the actual time because you might have built your libraries with some like uh, accelerations of the hardware that might like uh, modify uh, how much time it takes uh, to run the network. So in general, what I'm trying to say here is that um, you come from a background with deep learning skills and some like basic C++ skills. And when you kind of try to combine these two things, it just requires lower level software, software development skills. Um, and so what have we done uh, with respect to this? So um, this is uh, something that we're going to publish in NIME this year, and it's uh, something we did in collaboration with Rodrigo Diaz, Adan Benito Temprano, and Andrew McPherson. Um, it's a pipeline to run neural networks in, in Bella, and the and this is something that if you're super skilled, uh, you don't need this paper, like you could do it in your own. But this is just like to show like the steps of the chain. Uh, we tried to document it as much as we could. Uh, lots of like uh, example code. Um, yeah, so these are just like the steps of the chain that you have to follow in order to have like sort of this platform to prototype. So the idea here was always like, I had this big problem, like I want to prototype, I want to fix this issue with mapping. Um, uh, but I need a platform to do this. So this is kind of like the first step of the of the platform. And uh, here is um, kind of uh, more uh, what the platform, uh, what the pipeline looks like. So we have a data set recording, uh, data set recording libraries to record in only one Bella, but also like multiple Bellas and then synchronizing the, the signals like frame-wise. Um, yeah, then you pass those that data to your host machine, so your laptop. Uh, that is a processing model training and export. We did this in PyTorch and then we exported it into TF Lite. And then uh, we have a dockerized cross compilation environment, which is a very long name to say that, uh, yes, yeah, so somewhere where we can cross compile code. Cross compilation means that I compile it in my laptop and then it works in, in the Bella. Um, and yeah, then we just uh, move the, the executable, so the build version into the Bella and uh, hopefully it, it runs. And yeah, so um, this pipeline, um, yeah, it's going to be published in NIME. Uh, this is the work we've done in, in this regard. And I kind of, um, so the takeaway maybe from, from the talk is that, uh, or maybe not the takeaway, but what I wanted to, to say is that, yeah, sometimes we, we want to prototype and experiment and everything uh, people tell us about like, yeah, deep learning, prototyping and experimenting. But then when you try to pour those things into embedded hardware, there's like this big process about actually getting to the stage where you can prototype. And so I switched, I kind of switched the topic of my thesis to um, making these tools um, or making these workflows more understandable for people so that people who don't have like very strong backgrounds as, as me in lower levels so with software development or C++ can actually use these and incorporate it into their musical practice or uh, whatever practice they have. Um, and yeah, and also so that we can incorporate more gesture stuff into uh, uh, AI and music. Um, applications. I see lots of audio stuff, which is very cool, but I don't know, performance also has, gest has gesture involved. So um, yeah, hopefully this can can serve as a, as a start for people to start training networks on some uh, gesture signals. So this is all that I have to uh, show today. Um, this is my website, my Twitter, and also the website of my, of my lab, in case you want to check it. And yeah, thanks so much again for the invite. Awesome. Thanks so much, Teresa. That was really interesting. Um, yeah, I, I wonder also if you, is the repo that you listed, is that open publicly now? Yeah, so we just got the acceptance uh, on the conference, I think like three or four days ago. So yesterday I just made the repo public so that anyone who's watching the channel can can actually, um, um, yeah, check it out. And if you have any trouble with it, uh, please send me an email um, so I can fix it. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, if, if you if you send us the, the link here on Zoom, I think Josh can also put it in the chat on uh, on the stream so people can check it out. Oh, um, cool. I'll do that. Yeah, if anyone has questions, please put them in the chat and we can go through them. But I'll also um, start it off with a question uh, to get it going. I the, the, It's kind of a practical question of, you know, let's say I'm a person that's interested in doing some sort of in, uh, embedded thing on the Bella. I uh, have a, this kind of really cool idea how would you suggest going about figuring out if that idea is feasible, right? Because like you might come up with some 
huge idea. I'm going to use this neural network and it's going to do all these great things. But obviously there's a lot of constraints uh, when it comes to making uh, some sort of real-time system with a neural network. And I'm wondering if you had any thoughts on how you might go about uh, determining whether your idea is feasible before getting all the way to the end, right? Yeah, so this is a very good question. And I think um, that like most, like the thing that it's lacking in the pipeline is to have a sort of like way of diagnosing if your model is going to be able to run. As I said, like you can kind of like estimate it by counting the flops. It's not super accurate, but you could do that. And this is a functionality that I think it would be very nice to, to incorporate. Like you not knowing exactly in and the millisecond scale, how long it's going to take, but getting like sort of an estimate, like, are you in the right scale of uh, flops or are you too, too far away? But um, my approach to this has been, um, so this is like ideally uh, where I want to be in the world that I have, but my approach to it in practical terms has been, I'm just going to start with something very simple. So um, what I've been running is LSTMs with uh, not that many cells and then just trying to like, uh, like play around with the dimensions uh, and see what I can make fit that actually has some capacity for learning. Uh, yeah, so I, you can come with a very cool idea and then try to see how you can fit it. My approach that I think it's easier is try to come up with a simpler network and then you scale from there. Instead of, instead of compressing, it's better to scale up, I think, when you're dealing with these platforms. Fantastic. Um, yeah, we had a couple other questions here. Um, so one question that we have is, are there requirements for HPC in training the models? So um, this really uh, depends like um, this. So if you're like building, so the models, you don't train them on Bella because uh, it just would take too long. You train them in the in the host machine, so the laptop. And you can train them in a cluster if you want, but the sort of models that um, you would get, so for example, I'm using very light LSTMs, right? You can train these in your laptop. I mean, I have a laptop with a, a gaming laptop with a GPU and you can definitely train it on there. And I don't know if I've ever actually trained it on my Mac laptop, but I definitely, when I try things out, I do try them in my laptop and like try if it runs on Epoch and it definitely like runs. It might not be the fastest thing in the on the earth, like it, would be faster if you train it, train it in a GPU, but you can definitely do it. Like these models are very, very light. We're talking about a very small CPU in the Bella. So, so yeah, you could do that. Fantastic. Uh, Leo asks, is this work mainly based on TF or do you support other frameworks? So um, how, so in the pipeline, um, in the pipeline, uh, what we use uh, for inference in Bella is TF light. Uh, my colleague Rodrigo, who I wrote uh, the paper with, uh, he wrote this deep learning for Bella library. And in that library, there's front ends also for LibTorch from Py PyTorch and also Arthi Neuro. And I think ARM and N as well. Um, I would use only the, inf like, the inference engine of TF Lite because I thought it was uh, the easiest for me to understand what I was doing. And also technically you can export PyTorch models into TF Lite. It, this has some subtleties to it. Like there's some layers that don't map directly from PyTorch to TF to TF. And you have to always check that the model gives the same results when you convert it into TF. Uh, my approach to this was just coding the network directly, like with the operations rather than using like uh, the PyTorch uh, LSTM. Like I just wrote the actual equations. Uh, so like sums and multiplications, this uh, always translates well. Um, so yeah, so uh, to like sum up, uh, the inference engine is the applied, uh, but I actually wrote the code in PyTorch and then exported a the applied model. Fantastic. Uh, that looks like that's all the questions for now. Uh, thank you very much, Teresa, for your talk. Very interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks for, for sharing that.